Dantes, for the first time this year, I believe, is going up to 50,000. This year, we again had virtually no tenants testify, except for their representatives, but had numerous individual landlords testify. In fact, one tenant testified three times about what she said were appalling conditions in the building in Mount Vernon. However, what we did learn was that, number one, landlords cannot provide what they consider adequate maintenance repairs, and the survey shows to be so over the last couple of years. Two, that the landlords are selling their buildings, and tenants are unhappy with new landlords who are according to them not providing sufficient services. It's interesting to note that the zero-zero lack of increase in 2010 and 11 just really hit through 12 and 14, and still showing up this year to some extent. Since almost 60 percent of the tenants take two-year leases, and these leases took effect between October 11 and September 12, the effect of the zero guideline hit between 11 and 14, thus denying landlord increases they needed to keep up with inflation and the cost of living. And as you've heard, as, as you have heard, make required repairs and keep the buildings in the condition that everybody wants. And the one and a quarter, two and a quarter increase the following year, and last year's one and a fifth, one and a half, and two and a half just exacerbated the situation and compounded the lack of money when the cost of living keeps rising. Over the years, looking at figures since the year 2000, the average one-year increase in New York City was 3.4% and in Westchester 2.6%. Significantly also is the fact that the two-year difference is more substantial. In New York, over the years, the average the increase average 6% and in Westchester 3.7%. The landlords in Westchester County are constantly trying to catch up, but it's like being on a treadmill you never do. I think it's important that we understand that the cumulative effect of the low and zero increases is destroying affordable housing stock in Westchester. Landlords just cannot survive with a zero increase four years ago, one and a quarter and two and a quarter, and one and a fifth and two and a fifth. Uh, the, what, what this does basically is it puts the landlords behind inflation and gives some tenants the ability, if they took the zero increase, to only have a two and a quarter increase after that for uh, two years. So over four years, a total of a two and a quarter percent increase for the tenants that got lucky enough to be uh, available to sign a two-year lease in the first year of 11 to uh, 10 to 11. The, uh, the economic condition of the real estate industry is, uh, uh, is one where we can agree with the tenant advocates that rent-regulated housing units in Westchester are decreasing substantially, from 50,000 to 30,000. Why? Look at the minimal guideline increases. This is a major reduction in affordable housing in our county, and we must think of the reasons, and we should not be responsible for further decline, either through additional co-opting of apartments or discouraging investment in affordable housing or abandonment of buildings. A guideline increase that is too low will do just that. A guideline increase that does not take into effect the low rents will also do that. ETPA's artificial limitation on rents is a drag not only on the construction of new housing, but it inhibits the maintenance of existing housing. Keep rents artificially low, you'll have less and less affordable housing. And moreover, the condition of housing will deteriorate without reasonable rent adjustments the, uh, to allow a landlord to not only keep pace with the cost of living, but the increase in expenses. Also, as we've seen, repairs are a constant source of complaint. And the reason is obvious. Look at the cost of living information provided you. The Westchester guidelines have not kept up, kept up with the cost of living in approximately nine of the past 10 and 11 years. Therefore, when we consider the added expenses, the cost of living, the real loss in income to the landlords is significant for this survey year. If we want people to invest in and improve affordable housing, we have to allow them to not only stay even, but to make a reasonable profit. And as we've heard from multiple small landlords, who either have family-owned or small building investments, it is getting to be more and more impossible. Is it un-American to earn a profit? If you can get a guaranteed return in your bank, why invest in real property? If you fail to guarantee a reasonable profit, and I direct this obviously at the public members, it will drive out responsible landlords and leave us with people cutting corners to just stay even. This does not work to anyone's benefit. 
In a couple of articles I found on the internet, I'd like to summarize for you what their statements are. Great control does not work. Liberal economists and conservative economists virtually all agree on this. The only reason it still exists in some places is that it is politically impossible to get rid of. That is why it had to be abolished on a state level by voters wrote in Massachusetts and kept the politicians out of it. Here is the basic reason it doesn't work. When landlords cannot make a profit by building rental apartments, they will not build rental apartments. So the people who already have a rent control place end up paying very little rent, which is great for them, but for everyone else who's not lucky enough to have one, there is no new supply and it actually makes affordable housing shortage worse. Robert Rice, a former Clinton Labor Secretary, is one of the most outspoken critics of rent control, and he's a very liberal guy, so this is not a conservative Republican viewpoint. The economic effect of rent control is such that most economists believe that a ceiling on rents reduces the quality and quantity of housing available. This view is based on analysis of empirical evidence, as well as the understanding generated by theoretical models. Economists from different sides of the political spectrum such as Paul Krugman and Tom Sowell, have criticized rent regulation as poor economics, which despite its good intentions, leads to the creation of less housing for higher prices and increases urban blight. A survey of articles on a conlet, uh, website regarding rent control finds that economists consistently and predominantly agree that rent control does more harm than good. The survey encompasses particular issues such as housing availability, maintenance, housing quality, rental rates, political administrative costs, and redistribution. And we've heard from one of our, with, uh, one of our speakers about the huge administrative and uh, <coughs> paperwork that's involved in uh, ETPA. Price ceilings can create shortages that reduce quality when they're less than the equilibrium price. By capping the price of housing, rent control increases demand and reduces available supply, causing a shortage. Uh, rent control also reduces the quality of available housing, deters investment, and raises rents on tenants who are excluded from its protection. We've heard plenty about the skewing of rents in buildings where one floor, you may have $700, a floor above, $1,400, floor below, uh, some other number. When property owners are restricted in the rents they charge, they're less willing to do more improvements and more repairs. Since supply is low, Landlords worry less about tenants leaving and have little incentive to maintain the property. Building maintenance deteriorates in order to mitigate the lower rental income. Let's avoid that by a reasonable increase. People moving into the, into the county have difficulty finding housing because of the shortages created by rent control. Again, let's avoid that and let's give people the incentive to, uh, to increase the availability of rental units. Some, such as William Tucker, a leading libertarian thinker, have argued that rent control laws are a textbook example of the problems that arise. Chuck, will you let me know when I'm, when I'm about to end on? Yeah, you're at nine minutes and 16 seconds. I'm at nine minutes? Uh, uh, are example of the problems that arise in trying to artificially reduce prices. The natural consequence in a free market economy is a reduction in supply and consequent shortages. Rent control has a perverse effect of creating less affordable housing. Areas with rent controlled housing are blamed for difficulty of finding vacant housing and the resulting power balance between landlords and tenants as tenants may game the system to impose onerous conditions on the landlord, forcing long cycles of, of judicial action leading to considerable economic hardship for the landlord. Likewise, new tenants have serious difficulty finding housing so they're seriously disadvantaged uh, if they have to move. Uh, the costs of rent control are not only borne by the landlord, as we said, but the loss of income results in reduction in assessments and less monies to the municipalities and subsidies by single-family homeowners. And we've heard all about the effect of such sharings. Moreover, as is recognized even by the tenants, it leads to the housing shortages, which we've just talked about. We only have to look at other cities, Chicago, Philadelphia, San Diego, uh, Seattle, where there are no controls, vacancy rates are over 7%. So not the case in New York City, where it's under 5%. Cities such as Boston and Cambridge have abolished rent control, and not only did everyone survive, but there were more apartments available and more available affordable housing for new and larger families. 
I'd like to read you a short article written by an economist, uh, Timothy Taylor, about the uh, elimination of rent control in uh, Cambridge and Boston. The rent, control, the rent control buildings in Cambridge, Mass, typically had rents 25 to 40 percent below the level of uncontrolled rental buildings nearby. However, the maintenance of rent control buildings was often subpar. Sound familiar? With a higher incidence of is issues like holes, walls, floors, paint, uh, railings, and the like. Owners of rent control properties had no incentive to do fix-ups because they would be unable to properly recoup the cost. Taking all this together, <clears throat> the way to think about rent control was that it created a situation of low quality and poorly managed housing stock, which then rents for less than uncontrolled properties. If the goal of public policy is to create lower quality and more affordable housing, there are other ways to accomplish that goal. We could change zoning laws, we could mix rentals, we could do other, other things to get more affordable housing. Or those for, with lower incomes, goods as we have here, receive housing vouchers. But when rent control is enacted in a way that leads to de degradation of a substantial portion of the housing stock, and we heard one person after another complain uh, from a tenant's perspective, uh, not about the amount of rent they're paying, but about the quality of the housing that they're in. The costs are not just carried by landlords of those rent control departments. In fact, the majority of the costs may be a result of the spillover effect to real estate that isn't rent controlled. When a substantial proportion of the houses in the neighborhood are not well maintained, everyone suffers. Uh, over the years, while long-term tenants uh, continue to stay in their apartments, reducing the availability of housing, new tenants have to look for either luxury housing or rentals, pay rentals that are much higher than necessary. This skewing of the market can be avoided by at least providing, number one, a low rent guideline increase and a reasonable regular percentage increase. Moreover, if we've, as we've heard, there are some apartments in the higher end of the scale and the higher teens that are paying preferential rents since the market dictates the rents to be collected. The only fair way for both landlords and tenants is to equalize the rents being collected so that the market will take over and there'll be a reasonable availability of apartments and people will be encouraged to invest. We must encourage, not discourage, investment. We have a new generation of landlords that we've heard of who want to provide housing, but also want to make a reasonable profit, which they can't do at zero or one or two percent. Expenses increase exponentially and income barely increases. We've heard much about vacancies. However, that's a phony argument, because number one, if you add the numbers together, those numbers are the legal regulated rent and most of the rentals that get up to over 1,500, 1,700 in Westchester County are preferential rents. So although you might have a rent where you figure the numbers at $2,000, the tenant may only be paying 1,500. So the numbers that we were given by one of the tenant reps are not real numbers. They're uh, numbers that are only uh, accurate if you take the full legal regulated rent which obviously at 2,500, 3,000, 3,500, nobody pays. As to the increase in vacancies, approximately 25% of the units, according to your charts, have under a 5% increase. Over 90% of the units, according to the charts, have less than a 30% or 50% increase. A significant number of vacancy rents are either within the same statistical range of the charts that you have. And the charts, as I've said, reference the legal regulated rent but that's not the real rent that's payable. Vacant units have gone down in the last year, over 16% after going down 21% the year before, and 15.7% 15, and 15 the year before that. And of the vacant apartments, only about 20% were vacated as a result of high rent vacancies. So what are the real issues for landlords? Taxes, going up again, an increase from 1.1% over the prior year to 3.8% a major increase in the major expense for all landlords. Insurance, which doubled last year. Fuel, although having gone down, now went up 18% in the last four months. Repairs, down by 50%. Is that what we want? As I've said, vacancies are a red herring. Incre income increased at a much lesser rate than last year, 3.6% as, uh, as against 2.5% this year. Chuck, how much time? Uh, two minutes, 50 seconds. Uh, if you look at the cost to income ratios, which the tenants look to as profit, 
that it's really only the amount of money that's available for payment of mortgage, establishment of reserves of capital improvements, major capital improvements that don't get MCIs, and about half the uh, major capital improvements don't get MCIs. There is actually 1.2% less income available for those items, not even considering the marginal profit. Considering the total amount of income for the uh, regulated units that are reported is over $245 million, 1.2% lost is almost $3 million, unavailable, which went for increased expenses. Uh, the, the negative impact of controls we told you about, deterioration, reduced property tax revenues, substantial administrative costs, uh, and landlords are unfairly burdened, and I ask that the public members of this board not burden them further with extra statutory factors. Thus, the landlords are caught in an ever-swirly cauldron of increasing expenses including taxes, repairs, maintenance, utilities, while the income is not increasing as if, as, at as fast a pace. The result is less cash flow, less income, less profit, less money for improvement, less upgrades, less repairs, less property, less uh, ability to keep properties from leasing, leaving the housing market. Every year we hear the question, why are there landlords? Well, I don't think we'll have many more landlords if we continue going at the rate we've been. You want to kill housing for those in rent-regulated apartments? The surest way is to provide less than adequate rent adjustment. So we ask that you save responsible landlords, save affordable housing, and provide a reasonable increase of 44% for one-year leases, 6% for two-year leases, with minimum increases of $40 to $60, depending on whether it's a one- or two-year lease. Thank would you, you very I'm much. Sorry, would you just repeat the numbers again? 4% for one year. <laughs> 6% for two years, $40 with a $40 minimum for one year and a $60 minimum for two years. Thank you. I can make a joke. 35 seconds to spare. 35 seconds to spare, can I do a little tap dance? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Well, just, you know, stay up there and uh, I'll use you want to go up there with him, it's fine, but it's entirely up to Stay both of you. Uh, I'd like to open it up to the board members if you have questions or comments. I'm not going anywhere, I'll be around. What? I'm not going anywhere, I'll be around if you have questions. Yeah, I know, I know. Elsa? Yes, Elsa? Do you have copies of the, of, of, of the presentation you just gave that we can have? Of oh, which? Copies of the presentation you just gave. <laughs> Not really, because I, 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 I use this as an outline, and, and I, I change it. Howard will give it to us, no doubt. Yeah, Howard can do it. He'll give it to you. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I do have, though, but I do have one article I'd like to hand out, <coughs> which I forgot. Okay, well, I, I actually have two questions. Can I? Uh, can one question is that you said that we heard um, testimony from public uh, that land from well the owner members of the public or representatives that landlords are selling their buildings. Yes, you heard I from Mr. I think Solari I heard one individual who said something about selling a building, but I, I are you aware I mean, of any other buildings that have been sold? Um, I actually, CBA, uh, actually, I am, and we're representing a couple of people, so I can't really. I, I, I have a conflict there. Well, I'm not but, asking for. Names. Yes, I am. I, I am aware of other people, in addition to Mr. Solari, who has sold uh, one building last year, and it, I think is in the process of selling two more buildings at this point. These were small. Uh, small, small landlord, the ten and twelve units mm -hmm. or something like that. Thank you. I, I have Can one I just more. Add to that? Yes, of course. Uh, besides what Ken mentioned, I also am aware of uh, many clients who are selling buildings and getting out of the uh, residential market in New York City and in Westchester. There is without doubt many clients, I have some clients who had hundreds of <coughs> rent-stabilized apartments throughout New York City. They have given up on it completely. They buy medical buildings in Arizona. They buy medical buildings up here. They buy that. They have completely gotten out of the business because of the low rent guidelines, because of the constant controls. 
and because of the increases in taxes and the other water and sewer, especially in taxes, it's a burden that they just can't take. They can take more money with other buildings, no, the commercial no buildings, for example, without residences in them, and that's where they can make a reasonable profit. They're not making a huge profit, but they're making a profit, and profit is what is required if you're going to maintain these buildings, plain and simple. No, I'm sorry, I, I didn't say it, but I really was thinking of Westchester. Uh, but in any event, thank well, you. Well, I think that, you know, I mean... Well, I was referring to Westchester. I mean, New York City, in no, fact, has, you, has not, except for last year, the New York City guidelines were pretty high. Well, that may be, but, the, I, you know, I, when, I was on the board, when I was on the board before, I always found the argument about New York City and Westchester as if they're separated by you know, uh, the middle of the country. This is New York City. Westchester would not be here without New York City. New York City is the engine that drives the state of New York and the tri-state area, Connecticut, New Jersey. And the fact is, it's right there, and many of us make a living in with New York City. We'd probably have no jobs if there was no New York City. And the, the low-income housing, the rent-regulated housing in New York City is exactly the same as the rent regulated housing in Westchester. There's no difference. What possible difference is there? There's none. It's just in the amount of the rents. Uh, I'm sorry? I have another question, but if anybody on the board has some comments or questions, please. Uh, <coughs> I have a question yes. about um, the profits, the lack of profits by the, uh, the owners. Now, are you saying with the your presentation that there was no profit, and because there was no profit, we have uh, repairs that are not done, and that's what's providing the substandard housing. Well, I think I think the problem that you have, <coughs> Jimmy, is that landlords are burdened not. <coughs> Jimmy. They have a burden not only with the expenses, but they have obviously mortgages, taxes, and other things that have to be paid. Uh, they're going to uh, try to eke out some amount of money as compensation for their own efforts, uh, whether it's a management fee to manage a building, or it's their own sweat equity to get back. And I think but, uh, where it comes from is it comes from repairs, because that's where you can squeeze it out of. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that there is a minimal amount of profit. If you look at the if you look at the numbers on the cost to income ratio, which I think is somewhere around uh, 88 percent or something of that nature, 89 percent, that doesn't even uh, consider the uh, that doesn't even uh, fact. That doesn't even factor in the uh, cost of a, more, of a mortgage and uh, cost of profit and uh, uh, some of those items. So that uh, there's probably some minimal profit there in some buildings and there's probably no profit in others. I think we have, if we, if we had a reasonable profit, uh, look, if you can get uh, some, some money from bonds and things of that nature, why take a risk in real estate with all the excuse <clears throat> me with all the effort that it takes? And we've heard that people are getting out of real estate, and that's the reason. Uh, there has to be a reasonable profit. Uh, Madam Chairman, can I just clarify something? Uh, I, I heard what you said about this is not New York City, and I just wanted to clarify: the clients that I'm talking about have many or had many buildings in Westchester. There are plenty of landlords who own buildings in New York and Westchester. No, I don't and, <coughs> and, and the fact of the matter is, is that they've gotten out of New York City and they've gotten out of Westchester. Because to a landlord, they don't look at it as, as you know, there's a, a line someplace out there. They look at the same thing. It's the same factors as the profits, the rent guideline increases, etc. So I'm just backing up no, what Kenny said. My point about Westchester, I'm going to repeat it is that the guidelines, except for last year, the New York City guidelines have been, I think, what most people would agree are pretty high. Certainly I mean, much higher. higher. Certainly higher. 
Well, substantially it, higher than the guidelines in Westchester. I, I, I think that's an interesting point. I think we agree, we agree with that. Yeah, okay. And we're that's, trying to we're trying point. to equalize that this year and at least bring us back up because in the city, even though you have had those higher increases, there's still been some deterioration, but I think not to the extent of Westchester. I think you hear different complaints in the city's rent guidelines. Here you heard about the condition of the buildings, I not about rents. And it's the, the, we're not talking about south of 96th Street in Manhattan. We're not talking about Brooklyn Heights and some of the other very Tribeca, uh, uh, Soho. I'm comparing apples and apples, not apples and oranges. Right. And if you compare the apples and apples, you're talking about Bronx, Mount Vernon, Yonkers, etc. These are apples and apples, and you're 100% right. Even though they get a higher increase, or historically have gotten a higher increase in the city, they're still selling. So what does that say about Westchester? Getting even lower, it would it's be more of an incentive to sell. It would be good to have some figures on that. Well, but we have, I think we, I think we, got the I think we, we got really the, talked this We got this, the first thing we got from DHCR this okay. year, was New York City's rent stabilization numbers. And if you look at that, you look at oil. Look, oil is the same in Westchester as it is in New York Ken, City. let me interrupt you. I Really, I think we've talked this into the ground. We have another presentation. Right. I have another question, but it's a, a very easy question to answer. It's a, uh -oh. a factual question that I, I'm just not sure if I am correct. That if it, Because you talked about preferential rents. Right. If a tenant is paying a, a preferential rent, and it's kind of funny to ask it now because we really have no idea what's going to be happening with the uh, the law in the next. Uh, we don't know yet. Let's go um, but I'm going to ask anyway. If if a, a tenant's paying a preferential rent, but the new guideline uh, causes the rent to go to 2,500 or whatever the number is, if there is a number. Uh, can the apartment be decontrolled not when it becomes either, Not unless he, if vacant. the tenant is, if it's vacant, yes. But when it becomes vacant, even if the, in other words, if the legal rent is 2,500 or 2,700 or whatever. Right, it's and it becomes vacant, be, it's decontrolled. Even though the tenant is not paying that much, it still becomes decontrolled, correct? Yeah. Right. Upon vacancy. Upon vacancy. Upon vacancy, yes. vacancy, if somebody is in that apartment, in order to, uh, <clears throat> to uh, decontrol it, they have to have two things, high rent and high income. No, she's talking about no, vacancy. No, 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 I'm talking, talking about vacancy. vacancy. No, I understand that, but that's what I mean. But in order to do that, you need both of those. No, no, no not, not vacancy. Vacancy. Well, a vacancy, yes, of course. All right, that's what she was, her question was. A vacancy. I thought it was a little different, but okay. All right. I, I, talking I, about an existing I'm sorry thing. if I wasn't clear. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. ETPA. There are units in Larchmont, East Chester, Pleasantville, Harrison, Irvington, etc. The board may not hear any testimony from these areas, but ETPA tenants are there. They too are part of the public. A speaker for the public referred to rent stabilization as essentially a social program subsidized by taxpayers. 
programs such as Section 8 and other programs are help the poor, implying that only poor people live in rent-stabilized units. All income levels live in rent-stabilized units. It is a fact that some of the smaller ETPA units are in some of the more impoverished areas of Yonkers, Mount Vernon, and New Rochelle. And some ETPA units are in some of the more affluent areas. Rent stabilization is a law. And shelter is one of our basic human needs. The owners of ETPA units invest in that human need and they expect that this board, they expect the board to give them a return on their investment. The owners are in this business to make a profit. Year after year, with the exception of 1983 and 2010, the owners' investments have been boosted by rent adjustment increases. The survey schedules also reflect a rise in income each year. A one-year jumbo CD at $100,000 yields from 0.40% to 0.75% for a year. Yet the owners want far more than even the bank survey. Thank you. This vote will continue. That was a shade less than three minutes. When you start, you will have 17 minutes and eight seconds. Chairman Morgan Stern, members of the board, Deputy Council Lesnick. Um, I'm going to address tonight two important factual issues and the overriding policy concern that warrant your serious consideration as we deliberate rent guidelines this year. One is the escalating affordable housing crisis in this slow post-recessionary recovery that is yet to trickle down to people in the lower and even mid-income levels, complicated by rent laws that need to not only be renewed, but strengthened to stop any further depletion of an already critically diminished affordable housing supply. And the other is the contrasting economic reality for owners, who see revenues increase year over year, even when the number of regulated units continues to decline, and whose level of net operating profit has remained solid and consistent, irrespective of any additional guideline increases, attributable to the fact the vacancy allowances and vacancy decontrol keep pushing higher end regulated units out of the system and bring other units that much closer to deregulation. The other issues I usually address in my presentation are more fully handled in the written materials that I have distributed to the board and entered into the record. What I won't be dwelling on is what the owners love to talk about, their expenses outside the context of their net operating profit and their objections to the ETPA law, assuming Albany acts to renew them, which if they don't, will make my comments tonight all the more meaningful. With respect to the ETPA law and owners' objections to rent regulation, it's not up for debate. It is not within the purview of this board to debate the pros and cons of housing law, which, renewed in whatever fashion, is the law. I'm not too happy about vacancy decontrol or vacancy deregulation or open-ended MCIs that have weakened the rent laws and depleted the number of affordable units. But if those items remain in the law when renewed, then this board has a duty to consider that fact when determining whether any rent increases are necessary given the level of increasing revenues derived from these vacancy rules. What is also not up for debate is that the current law 
or expired law, is the weapon of its own destruction, as it includes provisions to propel the ultimate loss of all regulated units from the system. With respect to owner expenses, as usual, I heard nothing from owners about the correlation between those expenses and their net operating profit, or about the additional revenue reaped from the vacancy allowances, as well as the additional revenues from the market rents being charged for deregulated units. It's important to remember that of the nearly 127,000 rental apartments in Westchester, only slightly more than 26,000, or about one in five, are rent regulated. The other 80% are not. And not only do they absorb rising expenses, but they also generate market rate revenues for owners. Before going into my analysis of owner revenue and profit, I'd like to first address the affordable housing crisis and discuss why, now more than ever, it has reached critical mass. People have no affordable place to live. Unfortunately, the slow improvement of the economy uh, since the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression has not extended to all Westchester residents, and the economic conditions for living here, the second most expensive jurisdiction in the fourth most expensive state in the union, place an impossibly heavy burden on those least able to afford it. Particularly hard hit are the cities of Yonkers, Mount Vernon, and New Rochelle, with both the greatest concentration of rent-regulated apartments and the highest levels of unemployment and poverty. The gap between income and rent continues to widen as the recovery seems to be going to those at the top much more than those in the middle and those at the bottom are losing ground. For those at the bottom, the gap between the cost of housing and family's ability to pay has only grown. Attributable to the surging cost of housing, the lack of affordable units, levels of unemployment higher than, and rent real wages lower than before the recession. Despite the immense need, the supply of low cost rental units is shrinking, and the number of households in the suburbs living in poverty is dramatically on the rise. Inescapable is the fact that the need for affordable housing, especially among the lowest income households, will keep growing. And yet, the number of rent stabilized apartments has continued to decline from 43,000 in the late 90s to around 26,000 today. As we know, this is significantly attributable to vacancy deed control, exacerbated by vacancy allowances and MCIs that continue long past their recruitment of costs, all of which we, the board, well understand. We can't control. But the board is directly accountable for larger than necessary year-over-year -year rent increases that have contributed to pushing rents beyond the means of the average rent wage in addition to moving more units out of or just one vacancy away from total deregulation. On the uh, lack of affordable housing and the gap, I'm going to refer you to the 2015 National Low Income Housing Coalition report. Um, it's contained in the materials. Um, which really it documents that the average rent, renter wage in Westchester at $17.57 is 43% less than that needed to afford a two-bedroom fair market rental. And as we know, many renters' income is significantly below that wage. For those able to earn that wage, the maximum affordable rent under HUD standards is $913 a month. Yet the average rent-stabilized rent of $12.98 is 142% more than that, and the current, form of mar current fair market rent is 170%, 74% more. But for those earning less than the average rental wage, the maximum affordable rent is much less. 455 for full-time minimum wage earners, 566 for those extremely low-income households, and for SSI recipients whose current average benefit is 542 a month, the maximum affordable rent is $246. So even those with regulated apartments at the average regulated rent of $12.98 a month are well beyond the means of the average Westchester renter and impossibly beyond the means of those making uh, minimum wage or in fixed incomes. And that is why it is absolutely critical at this juncture as a matter of policy to decline to enact any additional rent increases. Between 56 and 61% of residents in Yonkers, Mount Vernon, and New Rochelle, where 75% of the rent regulated units exist, pay over 30% of their income on rent. At the other end of the spectrum, raising rent guidelines unnecessarily for the 25% of regulated apartments with rents over 1550 jeopardizes their regulated status, further reducing the supply of affordable units. 
contributing to the critical shortage and making it worse than it has been in the past are the following factors. And the materials backing this up are all contained in the uh, binder. One, the surge in the number of rental households since the recession due to the steep decline in home ownership to levels not seen since 1965. The slow growth of rental stock in New York, which is documented to be slower than in other major metropolitan areas. Three, the surge in rents due to increased demand for a limited supply with New York rents consistently outpacing inflation and contributing to a housing squeeze that affects severely rent burden renters the most. And fourth, the fact that despite the economic recovery at the top, income at the bottom is essentially stagnant, putting even more pressure on these struggling households. With so few apartments available, period, and with even fewer of those available, affordable, to low or moderate income renters, you get a pretty good picture of why affordable housing is <coughs> at an all-time low, with three out of every four extremely low income households spending more than 50% of their income on housing costs. Now, as never before, the board, under its mandate, must take into consideration before enacting any more, must take all of this into consideration before enacting any more unnecessary increases that will make the dwindling stock even less affordable and lead to continued depletion of the, of the quantity of regulated housing that does remain. The, um, the, uh, my comments with respect to unemployment, seniors, poverty, and flat income, again, they're all contained in the materials. Now turning to the opposite end of the spectrum, owner income. I am keenly aware that whatever guidelines we as a board pass must achieve a balance between our statutory mandate to protect tenants from unnecessary rent increases while at the same time allowing owners to make, in the words of one testifying owner, a modest return on their investment in the context of the current economic environment. As in prior years, I would like to walk you through my analysis of the numbers. With respect to revenue, no matter what this board decides, two things are guaranteed. Even when there is no increase in rent guidelines, rental income always goes up, primarily due to vacancy allowances and vacancy deregulation. And two, the number of rent-stabilized apartments remaining in the system always declines from year to year. The number of apartments deregulated in the four years ended in June 2014 was another 5,152, a 16.5% loss over four years, and a loss of nearly 40% of regulated apartments since the institution of vacancy decontrol. At the same number lost as last year, it is estimated that an additional 429 apartments will become permanently exempt in 2015, and at that rate, in 2015, total units will be reduced to approximately 24,000. And if that rate of decline continues unabated, we could lose all regulated apartments by 2025. Yet despite the steady decline in the total number of units, based on the owner survey data, the rental income generated from this decreased number of apartments was up 2.9% over the preceding year. And as rents have climbed and rents on vacancy leases have declined even more, with average, average vacancy increases of 16% for one year and 18.21% for two years, it is a given that total owner income generated from a dwindling pool of rent-stabilized units will continue to increase year over year. If you look at tab one of the materials I distributed, there is an attachment that shows that for the vacancy increases on the 11.23% of apartments that turned over, owners made additional revenue of 4.5 million, and that just covers the first year of increases for the 58% of units included in the survey. The second year on the two-year renewals would generate another 1.184 million. Extrapolating that to 100% of registered units would mean increased revenues attributable to these vacancies of over $9.8 million just for vacancy allowances. And that doesn't even include additional revenues generated on another estimated 758 apartments that were permanently exempted in 2014 and are estimated to become permanently exempted in 2015. Under the current, just, ex just expired, weakened rent laws, whether rent guidelines go up or don't go up, owner income increased as it always does year over year. Second category, expenses. There is really uh, no need to explain on the arguments on expenses. All of it's included in the materials 
And quite frankly, it's not really relevant outside of the context of net operating profit. But suffice it to say, as of May 2015, monthly home eating, heating oil prices were down 25% from the previous year's increases. More important, they were down 37% from the high levels of 2008 when higher than usual rent increases of 4.5 and 6.5% were enacted and permanently embedded in the existing rent base. Tenant rebate anyone? Moreover, as you can see from the US EIA graphs and the Bureau of Labor Statistics June 9th release, both also at tab two, heating oil prices as well as electricity and natural gas are projected to stay fairly consistent with current levels. Higher expenditures due to a longer winter will be more than made up by continued low prices, prices which some owners may not have benefit, benefited from last year due, con due to contractual arrangements made prior to the surprise drop. Therefore, trying to base a rent increase on energy costs is not justified, since base rents are already embedded with the increases that were made in 2008 to account for prices that, were that are 37% higher than current levels, which levels are projected to stay the same through 2016. And now, onto my favorite topic, net operating income. I would like to uh, base the remainder of my presentation on the spreadsheet that can be found in tab one. Note that the income and expense numbers are derived from the DHCR data. Um, and in addition, the cost to income uh, ratios uh, are, are, are consistent with the analysis provided by the DHCR. 2014, in absolute dollars, owner uh, cash flow before depreciation was 5.32% higher than in 2013, with average cost to income ratios from 2011 through 14, a healthy 33.6 to 34%. 2015 projected, I'm going to refer you to the column where I have the projected revenue and I am going to hand out separately because I can see that my time is running, um, the formula for how I got there. If you read the spreadsheet and the footnotes, it is very well explained how those numbers were calculated. The analysis proves beyond a doubt that the board was absolutely correct in enacting a rent freeze four years ago. Last year, the increases passed were higher than necessary, and in fact, a rent freeze was more than justified. Now you're being asked to compound past year's increases with more increases, when they're already guaranteed $10 million on vacancy increases and untold millions more from an estimated 758 permanently exempted units. So based on the several years of analysis, that I believe in hindsight has, has proven uh, over a number of years now to be sound and as a matter of public policy, I believe the time has come to not only freeze rents this year based on the numbers, but going forward to decline to enact any further rate increases unless and until such time as rent laws are strengthened to eliminate the vacancy regulations that enrich owners at the same time that they contribute to the demise of the system. We need to protect tenants and preserve the shrinking quantity of affordable housing that remains. And you, we can do it, knowing that owners will still reap more than modest net operating profits consistent with those achieved in recent years. I would like to use the remaining minute and a half that I have to um, make uh, an additional statement to the board. Reverend Lofton Woods and I would uh, like to use our last minute to raise with the board issues of concern we have with both the substantive and uh, concerns both substantive and procedural regarding the circumstances surrounding the appointment of Michael Rosenblatt to the board as a public member. As much as we like and respect Michael and have enjoyed working with him during the time he served as counsel, we believe his current employment by one of the best known real estate law firms in New York. You know, I'm going to interrupt you. I'm allowed to. I believe this is. I believe it's out of order. It's out of order for this. But if Michael wants to speak, I'm going to allow him to speak. Okay. Thank you. 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 Yeah, I think he has a right to vote. I think I'd like to have a vote on well, that. This is not proper, period. I'm going to ask our cancel for Personal attacks are not appropriate. We're not going to have a vote. Do you believe this is out of order? 
I, I think we're down to four seconds. So. <laughs> <laughs> this this well, is our so not, it doesn't count. This, this last couple of minutes. I mean, do we really want to get into this? Well, you don't like this person. You don't like. It's not, not about like I'm asking. 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 I'm it does put me on the spot, especially since part of the criticism is about me. Oh, um, is that so? But, but I don't <laughs> see how this affects what the board is going to vote on. Uh, yeah, well, it does if you would let me finish. Oh, I, I really, all right. Look, I am going to move you finish. out of order, but permit the hands out to be uh, distributed, distributed uh, which then, it already has Excuse me for one second, though, then I have another hand out that I, mm -hmm. I will submit my statement to the board. concerning uh, Ms. Roche's presentation on the guidelines. Michael, if, the, if it's about the guidelines, ask. If it isn't, don't. My view of democratic politics is that they are far removed from me. I was born into a socialist family. Well, I thought we were going to talk about round. this, then okay. I think I need to finish my statement. Michael, please okay. let your comments and your questions I, 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 I exactly relate to the presentation the on the guidelines. But, uh, I will say for the record, and uh, please put it in the record, we were entitled to 20 minutes for on the tenant side. We reserved our time specifically for this. I was within my time, and, other than the interruptions that I had. And this is a repeat of a few years ago. You're, look, you're welcome to spend another two minutes, if you wish, on matters related to the guidelines, not, re not related okay. to a particular board member and your feelings about him or our council and your concerns about him. I know respect, Michael. It is a concern. No, no I'm no, sorry. No, 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 Genevieve. Know, just continue. Please, if you want two minutes okay. I will end my comments on the guidelines, as is in the statement, that, um, based on what is in this statement, um, Emma and I respectfully request that Michael abstain from voting this year. Oh, you know what? Oh, 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 this is really outrageous. I know it's out of order. I have yet a you continue to, to uh, talk about it. It's I, not appropriate. I have a motion to strike from the record all of, the, all of these comments that were made by the speaker concerning uh, Mike Rosenblatt. I second it. Any discussion? On that one, you might not be able to. That one, he's going to be saying. I mean, if you just said. Now, can I speak about it? Yes. I've served on this board for about 12 years before I took my uh, vacation sabbatical. And before the current board, and the makeup of the current board, 
there were a lot of people on the board who it would be easy to personally attack them because of, uh, of stands that were absurd. The fact of the matter is, is that what just has occurred between these um, handouts and the constant <coughs> attempt to disparage Mr. Rosenblatt is totally, totally inappropriate for this board. The Westchester County Board of Legislatures, Legislators is the body that appoints people to this board. All of us, all of us. It's not up to us to decide who is appointed to this board. And they decided in their wisdom, as the representatives of the County of Westchester, to appoint Mr. Rosenblatt to the board. And it would be, if this precedent would be horrible if we continue with this and start attacking people because they do this in their life, they do that in their life, they have this in their profession or that background. This will, it will be a horrible future if we're allowed to do this type of thing. And I think we have to make the proper example now of expunging from the record all of this, including these handouts that have been made. I, I was going to gonna ask to clarify, if you would clarify I, I that. I also ask that these be taken and shredded um, because it is inappropriate and certainly has nothing to do with this board's deliberations as to how much of a guideline, if any, is to be made. It's just, it's an insult what has occurred. And I'm embarrassed by what has just occurred here. This is embarrassing to the board. Further? And the only way that this board can make it proper is to expunge all of this. Further discussion? Anybody? going to, if you would clarify that, um, I also ask that these, be taken, that these be taken and shredded because it has been appropriate and certainly has nothing to do with this board's deliberations as to how much of a guideline, if any, is to be made. And so I was looking for the motion. If, if, if you can't find it easily, you can just ask the maker of the motion just, to... Uh, the motion is... It was just before that. Well, let me just it. Well, let's let's just repeat it. it. The motion is to expunge from the record all of the testimony of the tenant representatives concerning uh, Mr. Rosenblatt and that the handouts uh, presented by the tenant members be redacted, taken away, and shredded. Well, that's what you're doing. Yeah. I'm sorry. I said that's what he yes. just read. Yes, so that's, 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 that's the that is the motion. Uh, the question has been called. All in favor of the motion, please raise your hands. Oh. <laughs> it appears that there are two members in favor. All opposed? One, two, three, four. 
I would like to abstain and I would like to make well, a Well, I'm going to ask for abstention. Well, the discussion is actually over. Four, four opposed abstentions. And I have a reason and I want to give it. All right. Okay. I, I respect uh, Michael and I, I, I'm glad that he is with us because the person that he replaced uh, it, you know, we had problems. I think we're, the, we're on the record, so, so don't go into personal stuff. No, but I'm, I'm going to say that. that uh, and I, I, I'm, I'm glad that he is with us. And, but I want to keep my hand out because I want to read whatever my colleagues have to say and whatever they think. I have another motion. Just the motion fails. I know I have another motion. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> yes, sir. I move that the statements made by the tenant representatives you know, be expunged from the record. I just remembered record. something that nobody else seems to have remembered. Definitely. We can't take any action at this meeting. No. All, all of the great legal minds, of which I am not one, neither great nor legal, I am the only one who had very, very belatedly <laughs> remember that we, the board uh, I, I don't know that this may... would be considered an action. It's more of an administrative uh, oh, view. Okay. Where, yeah. Whereas the chair makes a ruling and someone makes a motion to overrule the chair. But the chair hasn't made a ruling. I'd so. like to make a motion. Well, well I just, have just, I have a moment, just a moment. Just a moment. So you think it's okay? I mean, I, I think Does so. our council think we can proceed with these motions? I, I, since they are administrative. They're, 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 they're not uh, action motions. They're not action. They're, 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 you've asked the board for their opinion on whether or not uh, this should be continued or not. And I think that's valid for the purpose of this meeting. It's really administrative. Okay, so we'll proceed. Uh, Mr. Cherson has another motion. Right, I move to expunge from the record all of the statements only that were made by the tenant representatives concerning Mr. Rosen. That of course specifically excludes the handouts. Second. Discussion. Well, since I didn't get to give the I statement, and it's what I did say was out of context because I didn't get to. It's a one-minute statement, and I didn't get to give it. So people are being asked to rule on something when they didn't even. You, you all, you all are assuming I was criticizing Michael, and I was not. And you didn't let me give the statement, and I wasn't asking. We don't have the power to remove someone from the board, but I was asking for something that did relate to the, the vote that we're going to take. And I do object. On the record, I object to being treated like this. Elliot, yes. A point of clarification. What's the, other than? Shredding these uh, um, that's out. I, documents. I, I, What's the difference between this motion and the no, motion? The difference between the motion and this is that, as Elsa pointed out, apparently there's a difference between the uh, handouts and the oral statements that were made. So this motion has nothing to do with the paper handouts. It only has to do with the oral statements. And please, that, that, that includes the handouts. No, no, no. The original one included the handouts. Yes. The second motion is only the oral statements. Will you repeat expunge. it, please? Sure. The motion is to expunge from the record um, any and all statements made by the tenant representatives concerning Mr. Rosenblatt. So that basically would be from the end of the uh, for presentation uh, until the point when she started saying that I have this additional uh, matter or things I, to say about Mr. Rosenblatt. I recall you saying something about the handouts, but I think I perhaps did. you no, meant I to did. say that's not part of the motion. He's made a different uh, I lost it. It was just a clarification. He's made a different proposal. Yes. Any more discussion? I had second. You second it. Yeah, I thought. All in favor of the motion? One, two in favor. All opposed? One, two, three. Three opposed. Abstentions? I can't. No, because she's not doing it. 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 She's
Abstentions, let's do it again. Galeen, Aqua, and Michael Rosen Blatt abstains. And Elsa, and Elsa, and Elsa, and Elsa, Elsa three abstentions. And the chair, the chair did not vote. No, I don't need to vote. Mm -hmm. okay. There's no tie to break uh, I hope so. Uh, just a minute. I, I still would like to find out if any of the board members have questions about uh, Ms. Roche's and Reverend Lofton Woods' presentations. If you do, we'll ask them to go back and stand with the mic. Vacancy calculations. Well, hearing as uh, says Ken said, I'm available to all week. Okay. Here is none. Uh, before I ask for a motion to uh, close the, uh, to adjourn the, the meeting, uh, I'll say again, June 22nd is the rebuttal uh, and vote meeting. It will be back at the White Plains City Hall where we had the uh, last public hearing, 225 Main Street, uh, 7 o'clock. Hope that you and others will be there. Uh, and now, well, that's for most I think it's, before we do that, I have a yes. suggestion, just a suggestion yes. for next year. Okay, next year. This room seems to me, I mean, there's been a lot of new venues uh, since the last time yeah. I was here, and this room seems to me to be, would be much better for next week's meeting mm -hmm. than, let's say, today's meeting, where we have the vote. I mean, I know it can't be done this year. Well, I know Chuck, Chuck can yeah. respond so, to this, but I'm guessing it's just I mean, the fact that movies that we could get. A lot, it's a bad room for the city council chair. Basically, yeah. the city council uh, does not charge money both in Yonkers and Mount Vernon and in White Plains. The libraries typically charge a modest fee. This was $160. The courthouse, when we used to have it there, I think cost $3,200. Oh, so we're just trying to save money because we had to pay for the uh, well, 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 the the well, the well, you know, I, t I agree with Elliot, though. Do you like this room? I think I like this room. Okay. It's so comfortable. It's uh, okay. so here. So we so you know can go for $165. It's still less than the courthouse. Motion to adjourn. Motion. Made by Ken Singer. Second by Elsa Rubin. All in favor? Aye. Well, so any opposed? It's unanimous. We're adjourning. Yes,